They say the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Well, you, you and I, we were meant to be free. And now God invites you to a soul-shaking, chain-breaking, life-giving adventure with your closest friends. We will share our stories of struggle and bravely explore the uncharted places of our soul. We will do this together and promise one another We won't stop until we are free. Liberation awaits. Today, freedom calls out your name. This is the way, the new way to be free. Hey, good morning. I uh, sure hope you're doing well. Um, baptism day today, and that means uh, all of us get to gather on the fountain following this service and watch people get baptized. And today is especially good because it is absolutely freezing out there, and the baptistry is freezing. So if you had any doubts about whether or not it had really taken, you're about to find out, <laughs> because when you go under, it's going to be real for you, very real. So um, we're going to do that following this service, so stick around afterwards, and we'll all meet out there by the fountain, and uh, there's 20-some-odd folks that will be coming out there to be baptized, and it'll be a great day. If uh, you haven't been baptized, and later on throughout the morning you feel like this is your day, let somebody out there know, and we'll put you under frigid water and see if it takes for you, too. We'll be glad to do that. It'd be a good thing. So seriously, if you want to do that, I'll be glad to be glad to have that happen. So that's going to take place following this service. It's a great time to be part of our church. Um, the uh, averages attendances are higher than they've ever been in the history of our church. Summer attendance was 30% higher than the previous summer's attendance, which all that is an amazing thing and a good thing. And the reason I bring all that to your attention this morning is this. God is still moving, people. God hasn't somehow like lost control of all things and like all of a sudden he's not sitting on his throne anymore. God's still alive and active and changing people's lives and changing hearts and changing homes and changing marriages and changing individuals. And uh, we're going to celebrate that not only with the attendance numbers, but man, this after, right after we're going to go out there and people are going to get dunked. It's going to be an amazing thing. So God's still alive. He's still in control and he's still good. So y'all stop looking so grumpy. Everything is good. God is in control. Okay. So uh, we're going to have a word of prayer, but before we have a word of prayer, let me tell you what's happening. This morning is a tough topic. I mean, it is really tough. And uh, many of you will actually um, hear the topic this morning and begin to think, you know, I know somebody who needs to hear this. Because that's what we do in church. We think, oh, I'm going to send this video to so-and-so, you know, or I'm going to, I'm gonna, oh, let, are you listening, honey? This is for you. This is solely, so that's going to be the temptation. But this morning, I want to encourage you not to do that. And it will be your reflex. You'll want to do it. But what I want to say is, as we get into the topic, it's going to be so uncomfortable that just maybe it is just for you. Maybe it is just for you. And the reason I know this so well is I've been living with it for a couple of weeks. And frankly, it's made me incredibly miserable. And I can't wait to share it with all of you people, just so we'll all be miserable together as we try to figure out the topic. So let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, you are beautiful to us, and we count it such a high, high, high honor to be in your house and to worship you today. And Lord, I know you hear the praises of your people. And just to think about this around the world, uh, people all over just singing your praise and proclaiming your name today. And we're glad to throw our voices into that ring and uh, proclaim you are God, you are king, and you are victorious, and we're going to follow you all the way. So um, thank you for that. Lord, as we head into such a difficult topic this morning, would you... um, Allow us to open our hearts maybe in a fresh and new way, a way we haven't ever before. And if that's you this morning as you're sitting there, um, you can do that. Now, some of you may just be beginning your time with God or just experimenting. And and what we mean by this is, Lord, I don't want to write you off with my head here. I want to ask you to get to the core of who I am. And so if you're real, if you speak to people, 
Speak to me. Speak to me today. Hide me in your cross, Lord. I'm not worthy of being anywhere uh, other than the blood of Jesus Christ that has, that has redeemed my soul. I just am grateful to be used. So hide me in your cross, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. Hey, uh, if you're visiting, a couple things we've been doing. Uh, We've been in this series called Freeway, and the Freeway series is basically a not-so-perfect guide to freedom is the way way it is, and that attracted a lot of us who are believers, but we're not quite, we're not perfect, (laughs) and so it's kind of refreshing to to hear something like that, and so that's what we've been doing together, and we've kind of following these steps along the way, so we're doing them on Sunday morning, and then small groups are talking about it all over the place, and and individuals are doing the study, and the children are doing, the youth are doing the study, it's just been a great thing, and um, basically we've been through two steps so far. And the first step was awareness. It was awareness, you know what? I'm not quite perfect. <laughs> it's an awareness that we all sort of took in together and said, you all are beautiful people, but not a whole lot of perfection floating around here, you know? Maybe we could kind of learn something from this. And then the second was a discovery stage where we said, you know, there actually are some things that I can identify in my heart and life that aren't really as they should be. <laughs> and so, but today is the tough one. Today is the one we go after um, where it's going to involve uh, us taking some responsibility for what we have been been made aware of, and now we discover today's the stage of of ownership. See, it's very difficult when you discover things about yourself to own them. For example, um, it's difficult when you realize the bathroom scale isn't broken, but it's actually accurate, eerily, scarily accurate, you know. It's a difficult day when you realize all the... All the hair is falling off your head and coming out your back. You know, that's a difficult, difficult day. It's a difficult day when you realize your children aren't perfect. And if you haven't realized that, ask the person sitting around you because they know and they could tell you, okay? You're you're not, they're great kids, don't get me wrong. They're just, they're, they're not perfect. It's a difficult day when you realize marriage isn't as easy as it's made out to be on TV, it actually requires some work. It's a difficult day when you realize everybody can't be hard to get along with. So the problem just might be me. Maybe I'm the one that, that's hard to get along with. It's a difficult day when you realize that the addiction that was once for entertainment is now actually holding you. And instead of entertainment, it's actually become an obsession. It's a difficult day when you realize through wisdom and through courage what's going on inside of you is impacting what's going on around you in the hearts and lives of people you love. This is the ownership part of what we're trying to get at. So this morning, what I want to do is just continue to bring everybody down. <laughs> and so what I... <laughs> it's a, this is a terrible message, really, overall. But... Um, <laughs> I just thought that I should kind of give you some of reality checks. And so let's just talk about what reality is. And so here's the reality. Here's your reality. First of all, life is unfair. Anybody need convincing of this or can I move on? Life is unfair. I mean, um, you know, uh, AT&T, that would be a great example. Anyway, life is unfair. If if you work there, I'm sorry. Forget I said that. So life's unfair. Uh, Here's the other thing. People are going to hurt you, even people you love and people that love you. You're going to experience hurt. That's going to happen. If you haven't, consider yourself blessed. It's going to happen to you. Here's the third one. Yesterday's gone. I can't believe you aren't writing this stuff down. You know, yesterday is gone, right? It's like it's not here. It's not coming back. It's, it's, it's gone. And here's, here's the thing. You are not in control. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them. You are not in, if it's your spouse, don't you say a word, don't you say a word, I'm telling you. You're not in control. If we were, things would all be different, wouldn't they? <laughs> but we're not in control. Here, here's the last one. Everybody dies. Turn to your neighbor. You dead. <laughs> you, you, you're going to die. <laughs> all righty, that's, I think we've accomplished what we needed to. Um, let's stand for closing prayer, everybody. <laughs> Maybe lunch will be good. I don't know, because this was terrible. <laughs> so, so 
You know, I didn't have to convince any of you of that list. In fact, as I was sharing the list, everybody in the room was like, yep, that's true, Thomas. One of the truest things you've ever said, Tom. Stay right there, brother. You know, but, but you know, that, that's kind of our reality. It's what, what is true. And so, um, you know, this is what we all sort of have to deal with. And, and, and you'd say, yes, these things, things are really are true. But thankfully, it's not all bad news. And one of the reasons, if you're here investigating faith, I just want to share with you one of the reasons or some of the reasons why as I choose to follow Christian faith. Because frankly, this sort of reality is, is depressing. <laughs> this is bring me down. This is like Nicholas Sparks. This is a horrible, oh, sad, bad, ooh, you know, kind of thing. I just want to get all the emails in one week. So this is a bad sort of thing. But, but then, you know, there's this reality that Christians have that we, we have that kind of helps us with some of this. That we all acknowledge, man, life does stink sometimes. But God, from everything we read and understand, God is good. And so he said, yeah, people are going to hurt you, but what I understand about God, in fact, what God says about himself is, hey, dude, I'm, he didn't say dude, (laughs) hey, (laughs) creation, I don't know, Uh, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, I'm with you, I'm with you in this, not just when you smell good, I'm with you when you're stinky, I'm with you when things are not going well, I'm never going to leave you. And so the reality over here says yesterday's gone, but of what I read in scripture is, yep, but God has the future. And it's not just any old future. Apparently, there's a plan and a purpose that he has for me and for you and for everybody in your household. God's got all that wired up. It says it in the Bible. So I'm not in control, but apparently, God is. It comes with having that name on your door. You are the one that is in control. God's in control. So the reality is that I'm, I'm going to die. Everybody in the room is going to die. Some of you are going to die when we do the tank because it is cold, cold, cold out there. But... The reality is God offers life. God offers us life, not just in this world, and there is a fresh life in this world, but also in whatever comes next, whatever world comes next. And so for the Christian, that's sort of what we believe. Now, I'm going to trust the majority of people in this room, since nobody wrote anything down right there, I'm going to trust that all of us believe something close to these truths. Okay? All of us pretty much are engaged here. Most of us are probably engaged over here. I didn't surprise anybody. Nobody had to say, oh, I got to tweet that. I got to put that on Facebook. Nobody did that. In fact, most of you are probably agreeing with me along the way. But, but here's why I bring these reality checks to us this morning, and it gets at the topic. Even though we all know this is reality, we will spend our lives becoming experts at placing blame on others for these realities. We will spend our entire married life trying to place blame on these realities. Some of you, that is what engages your mind full time, is placing blame on those, because of those realities. We'll assign blame to a person when we feel we've been treated unjustly. Even though we know life is unfair, we'll say, oh, you did, you treated me unjustly. You know, we're going to assign, assign blame. Even though we know it's reality. We'll, we'll assign blame to everybody who's hurt us or has hurt people we love. And as a result, we stop loving people who have hurt us. Did I go too fast? Are you following me? So we'll assign blame for this. People hurt you. You say, that's the reality. But then we'll still blame them for hurting us. <laughs> we'll blame uh, today for what happened in the past. Some of you live in your entire lives today in one way because you're looking at it through a lens of one event that happened in your past. You're blaming that event for everything going on. And even though we know everybody dies, I do this. I, I hope you do too. <laughs> I'll still seek to understand why a person died. Especially if it's a young person. It's like, why are they suffering? Why are they dying trying to assign blame? And all of this leads to just a couple of truths I want to share before we head out to do our baptism today. As we look at the topic of ownership, here's the first one. Taking ownership means we're giving up the blame game. Taking ownership means no more blaming. Say, oh, Tom, it's psychobabble, blah, blah, blah. Just stay with me. You you can't blame your way to freedom. It doesn't work. And playing the blame game, playing the victim card your whole life, has been the condition of every human being since the beginning. 
And I'll take you there. Let me show you in the book of Genesis. God creates the whole world. Everything in it is fantastic. That's what, that's what the book of Genesis is saying. And he places in the, in the Garden of Eden this guy named Adam. Here it is, Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And so there is Adam in the garden. He has beauty and intrigue, curiosity, and even dominion over the animals. The world is his playground, but something is missing. And God immediately notices that there's a need in the man. And God understands that his creation would need the same community as the creator. We're made in the image of God, and the God cre uh, creates in community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he knows that we need that same thing in our lives. And so Genesis 2 verse 20 happens. The man gave names to all the livestock, birds of the air, beasts of the field, you know. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. You know what the word woman means in Hebrew? This sounds like a joke, but it is not. It literally means, whoa, man. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Look it up on Wikipedia if you don't trust the Bible. It's in there. Well, this is a game changer for all creation. That may be one of the most obvious comments of all I've made all morning. But not only does God create the woman, but he also creates community as something that meets a need that we all have. In other words, nobody does life alone in God's garden. And this is a special kind of community because it was free from anything fallen. And all this was as God intended. And the scripture tells us with this, with these words, Genesis 2 verse 25. The man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. Now this pause. Because this is something you have never experienced. It's something I have never experienced. Life with no shame. All is good in the garden for a season. But then the bad music begins to play. Now, I'm going to teach you something about interpreting Scripture. Whenever you see these next words, something bad's getting ready to happen. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God. If a snake is getting ready to talk, run. This is not a good thing. Voldemort is on the loose. This is not happy. This is not a pleasant place. Christians read this and are like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. A snake was snuck. No, no, this was freaky business. This was not normal. And so the snake was more crafty than all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And so the snake said to the women, which is weird, snakes talking. But anyway, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, let's get this straight. Now, the woman is talking to the serpent. <laughs> we can eat from the tree. So <laughs> this is third service. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> snakes. Well, no. See, we can eat from the tree in the garden, but we can't eat. Uh, anyway, so uh, <laughs> who talks to a snake? Okay. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. She's like she's explaining common core math. <laughs> you know, she's trying to get them to understand. Just send an email. So what... <laughs> You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. You're not going to die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that if you eat of it, your eyes are going to be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. But when the woman saw that the fruit of these tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened. Now, what that means is shame has entered creation. How do we know? Watch what happens next. And they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, listen, this changed your life. 
These verses change your life because what happened in a matter of seven verses, creation has gone from free of shame to cursed with shame, from innocence to guilt, from friendship with God to hiding from God. You and I live in the second half of that equation. These two, Adam and Eve, have actually turned from God. And Adam and Eve now hear God walking in the garden looking to spend time with them. I always think of this time in history as God was the kind of God who would come over, sit on the front porch, and drink sweet tea with you in the cool of the day. It was that kind of relationship with God. I know that's really foreign to a lot of people in the room, but that's the relationship they had with God. God would come and they would spend the night playing checkers and, you know, God always wins. But, you know, have all this kind of sweet tea and all this stuff. This was kind of the relationship they had with God. But this time God comes into the garden for the sweet tea moment and some cookies on the front porch. But no Adam and Eve. And so he knocks on the door and nobody comes to the door. Because Adam and Eve were hiding Because creation was ashamed, God had never experienced this before with his creation. So when God realized Adam and Eve were hiding, he asked this question of Adam and Eve, his only one, who told you you were naked? Who who gave you the knowledge of shame? Who, Who destroyed the innocence that I created you with? Now, All of this is leading to this point, so lean in closely, because when shame entered creation, so did the close relative of shame. Who told you you were naked? The man said. Well, the woman that I didn't even ask for, Lord, but you created her. You know, I, I didn't even want her. I was, I, was, I was naming the armadillo. I was naming the fly. I was naming the, like, the hippopotamus. You know, all that kind of stuff, whatever. And, and, and then you brought this woman, and <laughs> you did a good job. Now, I'm not going to say anything. It was a good job, but um, it was her fault. She's the one that told me, you know, to do this. And then, you, then he says, you know, to the, to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, well, it was, it was the, the talking snake. <laughs> you know, he was over there, and I was minding my own business, too. In fact, we were praying, weren't we, Adam? You and I were praying. And um, this snake come over here, and, uh, and he told me to eat it. And this is what I want you to see, all this. Blaming, blaming entered creation after the fall. God, I'm the victim of the serpent. God, I'm a victim of the woman. You see, the blame game is in our spiritual bloodstream, but it's part of our fallen spiritual DNA. Blaming didn't exist before humanity turned away from God. Blaming didn't exist before the fall. Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, because that's what we fallen human beings do. And here's why. We like to minimize our guilt and to make others look bad. And so what we do is we blame. But any time we assign blame to someone or something, according to God's word, we're functioning out of our fallen DNA. And here's what's interesting. Blame has never produced a spiritual fruit in your life. Has it? You cannot tell me a story. You know, Tom, when I blamed that person for what they did to me, I was alive spiritually. No, you weren't. Because it came out of a sinful place in you. It came out of fallen DNA. Now, what's really interesting to me about this story is technically Adam and Eve and even the serpent were telling parts of the truth. When Adam says, the woman gave me the fruit, was that true? Well, of course it was true. He was telling the truth. When Eve said, the serpent deceived me, was that true? Yes, that's true. And here lies the problem of blaming and responsibility and why we're all so good at it. 
Adam and Eve are blaming as a means of avoiding ownership and personal responsibility, and it's the same reason you and I blame people. It's the same reason we are kings and queens of blaming. As long as Adam could blame Eve, he didn't have to feel bad about himself. As long as Eve could blame the serpent, she didn't have to feel bad about herself. And both didn't have to own their own guilt. Now, there's this word in our culture, and you've heard it before, whether you're a believer or not. It's called victimization. (laughs) And what that means is you're constantly blaming other people for what's going on in your life. So, uh, well, I was treated unfairly when I was growing up, and so that's what you blame. uh, My parents were divorced, so I don't know how to have any healthy relationships. Well, he doesn't know how to communicate, so we just always end up at the same spot. Well, Tom, she, she blows everything out of proportion, so we always end up in these big fights. Well, it's the teacher's fault that my kids aren't any smarter than they are, because I know my kids are really smart. They just, they just look stupid. <laughs> you know, I don't know why. I don't know. It's the teacher's fault. It's the pastor's fault. He's too deep. It's the pastor's fault. He's too shallow. <laughs> if you lose your job, it's not your fault. It's the boss. Boss had it in for you from the very beginning. If you get angry, it's not your fault, Tom. They just pushed my buttons, and they know what buttons to push, and I just lose it if they'd stop pushing my buttons. If a relationship ends, it's not your fault. You're normal. You're unhealthy. You just tend to date completely weird people. Any of that sound even close to familiar to you? It should, because this is who we are, even in church world. This is every human being since Adam and Eve, and it's you beautiful people, and and it's me. Now, I know some of you want to push back, and I know you want to say, Tom, are you saying I need to take blame for everything that's happened in my life? No, I'm not saying, don't don't do that, That, that'd be be crazy. (laughs) You know, don't do that. I'm not saying that at all. Many of us in this room, one way or another, really are victims at times in life. I understand that. The first truth I wanted you to know was that taking ownership means I give up the blame game. Here's the second one. Taking ownership means it may not be my fault, but I take responsibility from here. Maybe this wasn't, maybe I didn't do this. You know, I didn't, wasn't responsible for how I got in all this and abuse and divorce and addiction. It was none of my fault. But from this point forward, it's on me. I'm taking responsibility from here. Now, like you, I've had that, you know, had things happen that are not my fault. You know, I've been hurt, I've been betrayed, I've been deceived, I've been falsely accused. I mean, I talked about all these things. But how I deal with that and how I respond to that, how I move forward from those injustices, that is my responsibility. And it's your responsibility. This is what ownership is all about. And and so I come to that point that we all do so often when there are really two choices on the table. And I hope you'll remember these two choices because you're going to hear these play out in your home this week, I promise. You're probably going to hear these play out at dinner, at lunch today. You're going to hear these these play out. And I hope you'll have some fun. You also carry little yellow flags and just throw foul, (laughs) you know, whenever this happens because it's going to happen, I promise you. But here's the two choices everybody has all throughout the day. One is to assign blame, and the other is to take responsibility from here. Two choices. Who's responsible? Blame them, or I'll take responsibility from here. Responsibility is what, what leads to ownership. It may not be my fault, and probably it wasn't, but I'm taking responsibility from here, and with God's help, we're going to find the free way. Now you say, Tom, what have you been reading, boy? Where is all this coming from? Well, I guess I, guess I would say it's coming from the New Testament. Uh, see what you think. This is in the New Testament. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. This is in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here comes. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all 
wickedness. Do you remember where blaming comes from? Fallen DNA. And to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So I've been living with this here for a couple of weeks. And it's been horrible. Try to see all the areas of your life, man, when you're just like making sure to assign blame. You know where I first saw this? Driving down the road. So like I'm driving down the road and someone will come flying by me. I mean like crazy speed flying by me. And I was like, man, that, that idiot's going to kill somebody. And then I'll go f- driving down the road, and I'll get up on one of y'all's bumper before I see the Alive Wesleyan sticker. <laughs> you know, and I back off a little bit. <laughs> but you get up on the bumper, and say, that idiot's driving so slow, someone's going to die. Of course, in those scenarios, who's driving the perfect speed? Well, of course, your pastor. Your pastor is driving the perfect speed. And I started to realize, I was like, my goodness, this blame thing's deeper than I thought. And so, so I've been doing a couple of things. Uh, the first thing that I've been working on personally, and you can use this for your takeaway if, if you want to. When I pray, I'm trying to stop using blaming language. Because I've realized that the majority of Christians pray with blame. Lord, if you, know, like, Lord, if you would just like, kill those people... I was talking about the Patriots, so it's all okay. I mean, it was just kind of a general direction, you know. Just, just wipe them out, Lord. Take them off the planet. Well, there's some of blame. Or how about this one, just to kind of keep it real. Lord, if you would just change Lisa. <laughs> and the Lord laughs. <laughs> yeah, right, Tom. But he just kind of changed Lisa. Well, there's some blame. Lord, if you would just make my kids do what I want them to do. <laughs> Lord, if you would somehow help me get this financial pressure off of this because of, you know, I lost my job, you know? Lord, if you would just somehow get those people that hurt me and, well, just don't hurt them bad, but let them know. (laughs) You see? And I realize that I'm doing a lot of prayer using blaming language. And so I've tried to stop that because it's coming out of a bad place. And it doesn't produce a good spiritual fruit. What if you started to pray no blaming language? And instead, what I've started to say is, Lord, what is it you desire to teach me from this? Because here's my reality. So, Lord, you obviously, blaming's not going to help anything. What is it you want to, sh- to show me, to reveal to me? And now God and I are having conversations that move beyond who's responsible. Who, who he needs to go get to what he wants to teach me. Now listen, when you pray, when, you have, when you're in your families, I'm amazed at how much of the dialogue with God centers around spoken or unspoken blame placing. Well, God just needs to help them. Here's the second thing I've been doing. When I journal, which isn't very often... Or, or when I'm speaking in public or private conversation, I'm trying not to bother to assign blame to people. Here's the other thing I've seen. I've seen it in marriage conversations. I've seen it in kid-parent conversations. And this is the way it works in church world. This group over here, you all, all offend me. And so what I'll do is I'm blaming you all for all offending me. Just to let you know. We already took the offering, so I'm going to go ahead with this. You know, you all offended me. And so what I'll do, it's not enough just for me to say, y'all have offended me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, did y'all hear what they did to me? And so you all come over here. We'll, we can still be friends because you're going to agree with me, and all of us now think y'all offended me. Do you follow what I'm saying? This happens in church world, and I'm telling you, it just ticks God off. And so what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to not bother with that conversation because what I'm learning is blaming actually shows my own fallen spiritual condition. And if I'm trying to get y'all to join me in blaming those, I'm telling a whole lot more about myself than I am anything else. I'm telling you, I got a problem. 
Does that all make sense? And all this leads to a question that I think is kind of fair, and it's kind of where the rubber hits the road. And the question is simply this. You know, we've been in this freeway series. We've got a nice T-shirt and got little books you all going through in our small groups and all. But today the real question is, do you really want to be free? Because today's where we start to work on this. I know you say you want freedom. It's very popular to say we want freedom. It has been for the last 30 to 40 years. That every freedom is this easy thing to sell. And we really want Jesus to make us well. But do we really? Because to get that freedom, there is a price that we have to pay. What are you talking about, Tom? Well, well if you want to be free, if you want to move from blaming to ownership, for some of you, you're going to have to end up or give up endlessly repeating and rehearsing how badly you've been hurt your whole life. That's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to give up endlessly repeating and rehearsing about how he treated you, how she treated you, or what happened when you were a kid. You're going to have to end up endlessly rehearsing and repeating how everyone else has mistreated you. And you're going to have to give up looking at the world as a hostile and unfair place. And you're going to have to give up your grudges and you're going to have to forgive some people. And just to be completely honest, some of us wouldn't know what to do without our grudges. It's become our identity. And for some of you, this is the most difficult thing for you. And it's making you angry even now because the identity is being challenged. Who are you to say? Well, the issue is the blaming has actually become your motivation in life. And it will lead you to a very calloused, lonely, hurtful place. To be free, some of us are actually going to have to embrace close friends again, and we shut them all out because back there, this happened. Someone who said they loved me did this to me. We're going to start trusting people again. To be free, you're going to have to give up trying to get sympathy from everybody all the time in the dorm room, in the conversations at work. Well, you know, this happened to me. That's kind of been your identity. Now, if by the power of the Holy Spirit, you begin to see a little light shining around inside of you, and it's hitting on something every so often, you're like, man, I can't blame them. I can't blame that group, but I'm doing it. And you say, Tom, I really do want to take some ownership of this, but I don't know how to do it. I just, I just want to offer you one thing that I'm working with to see if it's helpful to, for you, um, and I hope it can give you the courage. It's the only thing, really, that I have found to sort of rise above some of the legitimate hurt or rise above the legitimate guilt and rise above legitimate shame-producing events and begin to take ownership and responsibility of this, and it, go, it goes all the way back to where we started this conversation. It, it's, it's the but God side of our list. Where is the courage and where are we supposed to get beyond all of this? Well, it's the recognition and reality that you have a God that unconditionally loves you. What does it mean? Well, you're kind of mostly lovable people right now. But do you remember when you weren't? God still loved you. And some of you come in here and you haven't even turned an eye toward God today. And you haven't for a long time. You're here for something special, someone getting baptized. Well, God unconditionally loved you. See, when I can't come to that realization, what it means is if God loves me, then I'm able to release those people who don't. Does that make any sense? If I know God's for me, and I know God is good, and I know God will never leave me, and I know God has Tom's future, and I know that God has control, and I know that God desires to bring me life, then this is where my hope is. Not in hoping that you get your just desserts, not in hoping that I can avoid some responsibility by blaming you, but by receiving the but God side of that list. Does that all make sense? Now, as a church... God has blessed us. He has. And numbers are coming and all that kind of stuff, and that's wonderful. 
But I believe for whatever God has next, and we're praying and brainstorming and gone before God over some exciting things to think about. But I believe this message today is so pivotal for some of us that this is the message that's actually going to lead to freedom that will allow God's movement to continue to flow out of a healthy place. Does that make sense? Not blaming, not assigning blame, but actually out of freedom. Yeah, I've been mistreated, but I'm as free as I can be because of Jesus Christ.